Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the unconventional pastor. But before he begins, I have something that I want to talk about. And what I want to talk about is what Bob is going to be talking about. And I'm going to be talking about how Bob is going to be talking about the way fundamentalists are talking about the Bible. And that's what the talk about today is all about. We hope you enjoy it in just a moment. Good to be with you again tonight. My name is Bob Graves. They call me the unconventional pastor. And uh, tonight, as Joey had told you, I'm going to be continuing uh, some of the discussion I began uh, last time I was with you on Wednesday uh, about uh, what it is that uh, that evangelicals and fundamentalists say about the Bible. Uh, one of the things that they are saying about the Bible is they claim that the Bible says a number of things about itself. Uh, their belief that the Bible is the inerrant, plenarily, verbally inspired Word of God, according to them, is not just that they happen to believe this, but rather that they both believe this and the Bible claims this for itself. But I find that when I take a look at the Bible, I find um, I don't see the Bible making this claim for itself, uh, at least not uh, the way they do, in fact. And in, indeed, in many times, I see them doing things that, that strike me as being, um, and, and to be honest with you, I don't think that they're always being uh, deliberately deceitful. I, I think that they've just accepted a particular paradigm so that when they look at the text of, of the Bible and they read a word, they say, well, there it is right there. Don't you see it? It's right there, just as plain as the nose on your face. And yet it isn't there. There's a sense here in which uh, the story of the the king who has no clothes uh, and, to, and, and he's walking around privately until that little child states something that everybody really knows is true, that even the king knows is true. Uh, but we're able to get away with the, with the social awkwardness of the moment while we're all able to get away with pretending that what we're saying is even true. Uh, there's a sense in which um, uh, some people can get so caught up in what it is they're saying is true that uh, they just – they just make all the necessary assumptions uh, in what is being said in the biblical text to uh, perceive it to, as claiming things about itself. Uh, for example, um, uh, w one of the things that um, that I've seen here is uh, I've some people have uh, I've said, well, tell me, show me how the Bible claims to be the Word of God. And they, uh, one of the verses that would sometimes people would, would give to me would be something from, say, Second Peter chapter three, uh, verses fifteen and sixteen that would say, um, you know, bear in mind uh, that our Lord's patience means salvation, uh, just as our dear brother Paul as. Peter talks about Paul, uh, the apostle, also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. And he writes in the same way in all his letters, speaking in them uh, uh, of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do other scriptures to their own destruction. Uh, they would read this uh, this comment from Peter about the things that Paul wrote. And, of course, what did Paul write? He wrote these other letters we have, such as Romans, such as the two letters to the Corinthians that we have in the biblical text, Ephesians, Galatians, uh, Philippians, uh, these other letters to various churches that we know or at least uh, believe that Paul had written. Uh, and so they say that here it is. We see that uh, that they are Holy Scripture because Peter here is saying that that unstable people twist things, uh, even the things of Paul, like they do the other scriptures. So they're calling the writings of Paul scripture. And therefore, uh, because they're comparing what people do with Paul as something that they also do with the other scriptures. But of course, you know, 
this is a crazy thing because what they fail to realize is that they've turned this word scripture into something that isn't an honest understanding of the word scripture. Let me explain to you what the word scripture is. Uh, the word translated scripture in the Bible uh, is a word that doesn't mean scripture. And this is not just a matter of opinion. There is not a single linguist in the world who can demonstrate that it means scripture in the sense of the English word scripture. The English word scripture implies the idea of an inspired text. Whereas the word translated as scripture in the New Testament is a word that has no such reference in it at all. In fact, it's a very common word. It is a word which really means writings. In that day in which Paul and Peter are writing, many people wrote many things. Uh, and some people would write things to others that uh, were considered insignificant and they would make a, a writing of something, send it to this person. The person would read it. Perhaps it's a letter and they might file it or destroy it or get rid of it. It's just a letter. Uh, but then occasionally people would write certain documents or certain letters that were considered to have significant content. And whenever they had significant content, there would be people who would say other people ought to be be able to read this. But of course, in a day when no printing press exists, the only possible way, there's only two possible ways that pe other people can read this. You can pass the document around from person to person to person and allow all these different persons to read it. Or you can hire someone or find someone whose job it is as a scribe. Uh, this is also where we get the word scribble from. Uh, a, a person who's profession and whose skill it is to take a document that exists and make a handwritten copy of that document. And whatever that person writes down as a handwritten copy of another document is inscribed. And it was called a writing. And when the we find in the Koine Greek uh, words that are translated scripture, it uses the word that is used in that culture to identify any and all such writings that may be that might exist as the result of being mass copied by scribes for the purposes of being distributed to a wider audience. And as a result, that word had nothing to do with whether it was a philosophical work, a scientific work, a medical work, a religious work, a work that had, was associated with the temple, or a work that was associated with the decree of a politician. It made no difference. This word was used to describe any document that was so copied so as to be distributed. And people, when they read things, it's a lot easier to twist something that is read than it is to twist something somebody is saying. Because when someone says something, and then you begin twisting what they're saying, they are there to correct the problem. That if, if you were to say something to me, and then I turn what you said on its ear to turn it into something you didn't really mean to say and that you're not trying to say, and I claim that this is what you're doing and teaching, you can be there and immediately present to, uh, to correct my abuse of what it was uh, that, that I'm claiming you were saying. However, if I have something that you wrote and I am reading it aloud to other people and then I tell them, well, when you wrote this to me, uh, what you're saying and what you're meaning by it is this and the way it applies is this, I can say all kinds of crazy things and you're nowhere around to correct what I'm saying. So depending on the skill of my rhetoric, I might be able to actually produce in a lot of other people a lot of crazy notions that I claim you said in what you wrote. Now, this is a particular problem that can happen when we are dealing with written materials and the author of that written material isn't present in a discussion when somebody is attempting to explain what the written material is really all about. And this is true for any kind of written material, pretty much, uh, regardless of what its content is. So when Paul is, uh, is writing certain documents that are popular enough that they're distributed to amongst, uh, amongst many people by being copied, it's not a problem to be calling them scripture. 
in that sense, uh, if that's what you understand by the word scripture. But it's uh, it actually it's probably better to translate it as writings or inscriptions or mass copied, hand copied documents. You know, that would, that's more the concept of what's going on here. So when Peter is making this claim that people distort a lot of things uh, that Paul has written, he's also saying that as they do other things, uh, other scriptures to their own destruction, uh, he's not necessarily talking about uh, the Bible at all. He's just saying that, you know, these people, uh, they, they don't know how to interpret literature when they're reading it. They, they read the letters of Paul and they distort it this way and that is they seem to distort everything they read, you know, uh, because, you know, that's all the only thing you can read in those days are handwritten copied documents, you know. And so Peter isn't talking about the Bible here. Oh, he may be. But at the same time, even if he may be talking about the biblical text, there's nothing in this word to indicate that the writings of Paul possess any particular character that is identical to that of other religious writings, nor is there anything in here to indicate that the character of any of these writings, even the religious writings, is that of what we in our modern day call scripture. In English, the word scripture conveys the idea of being inspired by God. But in Koine Greek, the word translated from scripture has no such notion built into it. It isn't there. It doesn't exist. This isn't a matter of opinion. There is nothing in all of ancient literature to associate it with that. Only the tradition of the Christian church in making that claim because of the fact that the the writings that they dealt with were limited to, uh, for in many ways, those writings by uh, the uh, that have become known to us as the Old and the New Testament, the biblical text. So by this circular reasoning and by taking advantage of the fact that this word is translated as scripture and taking advantage of the fact that most people assume what the word scripture means and aren't aware of the fact that the word scripture in English contains a variety of implications that the word in Koine Greek didn't even contain, uh, they end up causing Peter to be making claims, asserting things, and drawing implications, and trying to use that as a way of teaching you what the Bible says about itself. And it's nothing other than, well, for some of them, it's an absolute lie. For others of them, it's just a faux pas uh, that indicates to me that these people who claim that this is the, the, the word of God, uh, yeah, they don't know how to read Greek. Uh, and, and, and to me, that's astounding. How can these people claim that the Bible is the absolute word of God and they don't care enough about the, what they believe to be the absolute word of God to even understand the language? And to, and to be honest with it. Now, that seems to me crazy. If you're going to believe that this is the Bible and you're not even going to be honest, this means you've got to come to this thing you believe are God's words and you can stand there in the presence of God and look in him in the face and distort his words. Indeed, this translation is doing the very thing Peter is warning people against. Unstable people ignorant and unstable people distorting the writings uh, to their own destruction. And I guess what? That would be, uh, I, I think that people can do that with written things. And this is exactly, in my opinion, what evangelicals and fundamentalists do with their concept of the Bible. They distort through uh, ignorant, they are ignorant and unstable people in this sense, in that they distort these writings to get them to say things they don't actually say. And Peter isn't here to defend himself, to say, that's not what I was saying. No, you, you, that's not fair. You can't be telling people that's what I'm telling them when I'm not saying that. And through their lack of understanding of the true nature of the language here being translated and using uh, our misunderstanding and kind of doing this bait and switch, uh, but in a sly sort of way, this is, um, this is abusive. Uh, it's uh, the kind of thing they do to their own destruction. Peter, in the uh, letter that he writes here, uh, the section here in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, is merely talking about the dynamic that people have when they're dealing with the writing uh, that is in front of them, where they get to kind of abuse the writing uh, uh, if, with the author of that writing not being present, and that they do this not just with the writings of Paul, but they do this with other writings as well. 
Uh, it seems to be a habit they have with writings. They abuse and misuse literature as a way of using it for their own agenda instead of being honest people. Now, there's something called comparative literature. Uh, there, are, there are ways that the people study the actual written communications. And, and in some ways, a comparative literature is a sub uh, is is a subfield of linguistics in that uh, comparative literature tends to deal with written words, whereas linguistics, more often than not, it, it really focuses on words as spoken orally. But uh, nonetheless, uh, so this is a statement about what people do with comparative literature. Uh, when they read stuff, do they, have they developed a reasonable hermeneutic? Have they developed a way of understanding the things that are said? Have they developed a way of being able to kind of get inside of the author's mind? Do they care to get inside of the author's mind? Or are they only looking for little nuggets in the things they read to prove their own agenda? Uh, if they're doing that, they're not really being honest with the text they're dealing with. And that is exactly what fen fundamentalists and evangelicals are doing. They're not being honest with this text and dealing with it. Instead, they're distorting it and turning it around until they get this text to make an implication about the biblical text that Peter isn't even making. And, you know, uh, I, now I realize that to many of you that I'm speaking, you don't possess the skill in Greek to know whether or not I am ignorant and unstable and distorting this, or whether it's they who are ignorant and unstable and distorting it. I, I realize that, and I have to uh, recognize that, that that makes it perhaps a little more difficult for me to have a compelling argument here. But I would certainly ask those who are fundamentalist and evangelicals to take a look at this word, translated scripture, and do an honest study of it and see just exactly what its domain of meaning is. And although it can apply to other writings that are involved with either the temple writings or writings that are involved with the prophets and, uh, you know, uh, the writings that are involved with those uh, gospels and letters that became part of our New Testament, that this word scripture does not indicate in and of itself as a word any of the particular nature or quality or characteristics that are assigned to it by fundamentalists and evangelicals. It, it's just not there. That word doesn't have it. In fact, Peter's using this word because that is a word used in Koine Greek that, that has this meaning, and he's using it in this way. We can't take words that appear in the New Testament that over time, over history, the Christian church assigned a deeper meaning to and then claimed that this deeper meaning we've assigned to it is the meaning that Peter gave it. That's not honest. That is, uh, that is uh, reading into Paul, uh, reading into Peter, reading into Luke, reading into, it's inserting uh, into the text concepts and notions that are not there. It's a dishonest way of approaching it. Uh, another verse I've seen people give to me when they're trying to talk about uh, what the Bible seems to say about itself uh, is uh, Revelation 1.1. Uh, 1, 1. Uh, that's a verse where uh, it just opens up the book by saying, you know, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants what must soon take place. And I hear this and I go... And you think this says something about the biblical text? I realize you do, but why? You know, uh, first of all, uh, the book of Revelation is, is a book about a vision, a vision that occurs on the Isle of Patmos. The vision itself is the revelation, not the text that's written as a result of the revelation. And, you know, and as a result, you know, this, this is the revelation uh, from, uh, but more uh, probably understood, uh, of Jesus Christ, a manifestation of Jesus that is seen here on the Isle of Patmos, which uh, God gave to the author here uh, to, th that he sees as having to do with the, the purpose of showing what must soon take place. This is a comment about the event that precipitates this book. It's not a comment about the book itself. And so I think it's very important that uh, just because we call uh, just because evangelicals and fundamentalists like to call the text revelation 
doesn't mean that any time you find the word revelation, that is a reference to this dynamic of the existence of the text. That's not so in this case, and uh, there are so many ways in which it is just not so in, in other cases. So this is another example of where they're taking words with that, have, that have acquired for them a significant meaning and assuming that that acquired significant meaning is the meaning of this word as used by the original author at the time that he wrote these things, and it's simply not the case. So this verse, even of Revelation chapter, uh, verse 1 and chapter 1, is absolutely irrelevant to any issue of what the Bible is stating about itself. It is more a statement about the experience that the John who wrote uh, Revelation is having on the Isle of Patmos. Um, you know, uh, some people would say, well, hey, you know, the New Testament often says uh, the scripture says when it's quoting the Old Testament, thereby it's calling the Old Testament scripture. Well, of course it's calling the Old Testament scripture. The Old Testament is, in the sense of that language, a document that was hand copied because it was considered significant. It was hand copied, thought of as consistent, just like the works of Plato were copied, just like the works of a lot of other people were copied, just as there were writings from all kinds of cultures and places and, and people that were copied. And certainly the Old Testament was was among all that literature that was copied. And so when uh, uh, when somebody quotes the New Testament in the New Testament saying, and the scripture said, uh, the, that's not necessarily any declaration about the nature of the text at all. It's merely identifying that there's this text that exists as a copy of an original document. And this is what it said and quoting it as such. Now, uh, one can understand, if they want to, the implications they believe may be present in that, but are those implications that have been acquired or those implications that are actually part of the text itself? That's something which uh, I, I think uh, begs a, a number of questions. And so just because the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, calling it scripture. Here again, we're looking at this word scripture, which does not mean what it, uh, in English, what it, what it uh, meant in this Greek language. It does not, uh, it does not mean this. Uh, it doesn't have the same implications. It doesn't have the same uh, domain of usage. And uh, for example, in English today, nobody would call if, 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 if my mother were to write me a letter, uh, if she's, she's been dead since 1989, but if I had a letter that she wrote to me and I wanted my, the rest of my family, I have seven, there's seven siblings uh, in my family. If I wanted the other siblings to have it and I didn't have a computer or a fax machine or a, a photocopy machine, and if I were to hand write copies of this letter that my mother had sent to me, um, I could send these to them. But would I call those letters scripture in English? I have sent you a scripture, you know. No, it's a copy of a letter that my mom wrote to me is what I would call it. Because, and the word used here that's often translated scripture is a word that that's all it means is a hand copied document. And so to think that, oh, well, you see, it's, it thus says the scripture. So it's calling it scripture. Yeah, it is, but uh, the word scripture there doesn't mean what you think it does. And, uh, and of course, scripture is the English word here, but uh, not the original word in, in the Greek. Now, one of the, uh, another verse that uh, I've seen, um, you know, uh, they will say, well, look at the, um, the, the prophets of old. They would speak and they would say, Thus saith the Lord. Well, you know, to me, this seems to be uh, opening up the door for the very opposite argument. If there are prophets who are saying, thus saith the Lord, and not everything that they said was prefaced by thus saith the Lord, that would indicate to me that there are things that the prophets wrote that the Lord wasn't thus saying, you know? Uh, and so uh, to try to use this as a, as a proof that the text is somehow the inerrant, uh, plenarily, verbally inspired word of God is to ignore the fact that the prophets who one often saying, thus saith the Lord, weren't always saying, thus saith the Lord, for everything they had to say. Uh, and so it seems to me they're failing to make the distinction 
and they're trying to notice this aspect that I see as a distinction and treat it as if it's not making any distinction for any of these words. Again, that strikes me as a dishonest hermeneutic, trying to turn the Bible into saying something about itself that it isn't actually saying. Uh, another verse that I find that people will give to me in trying to prove this would be, say, uh, Matthew 15, 16, where Jesus was saying, you nullify the word of God uh, with your tradition. Well, you know, Jesus is definitely talking about their traditions, but is he talking about the scripture? Is he talking about the writings? Is he talking about Moses? Is he talking about the prophets when he says you nullify the word of God? This word word here uh, can mean, you know, the reasonings of God, the logic of God, the purposes of God, the promises of God. It, it can mean a lot of these different things. And so what Jesus can be saying here and can be understood to be saying is all of these traditions that these people are having are contrary to what it is that God is doing amongst them, that is trying to uh, do amongst them. And this doesn't necessarily in that language have to have anything to do with an actual written word. And so by because they like to call the Bible the word of God, anytime they read in the Bible where, it's, where it uses the phrase word of God, they want to assume this is a reference to the biblical text. And it isn't. It, is, it, it could be, but it isn't always. And it doesn't necessarily have to be. That phrase was not a reference to the scripture inscribed, inscribed, copied words of God. It was a concept that had to do with the sense that people had a promise from God, that, that people understood that God was approachable, that God had a purpose in their lives, that God was involved in some form of active presence in their lives. And he, Jesus is basically telling these people, your traditions are counteractive to all of that. And uh, whether or not it's actually contrary, contrary to something specifically written by Moses or specifically written by a prophet or specifically written in the wisdom literature is not necessarily implied by that particular statement. So Jesus here is not – you can't make the claim and assert that this is a clear uh, description of Jesus uh, that, com that contrasts the tradition of the Pharisees uh, with the biblical text. It isn't saying that. It's only the habit of fundamentalism and evangelicalism of using this phrase, the word of God, as, as if it merely applies only to, um, uh, to the, the biblical text. In fact, um, Jesus and, and other New Testament writers use this in a manner where, you know, uh, you know, God spoke to us in many ways in time past, but in these recent days has spoken to us through his son. Jesus is the spoken word of God. And there's a sense here in which when Jesus could talk about, you know, tear down this temple and I will raise it again in three, three days. And they thought he was talking about the temple that they were looking at instead of the temple of his body, which he was actually speaking of. Here, you know, since Jesus did tend to speak that way and make references to himself, he could be even – I think it's – I think it's honestly argued from this text that you could say that Jesus is actually telling them your traditions nullify me, my purpose, what I'm doing here. And that is something that Jesus could actually be saying here in the verse here, Matthew 15, 16. In fact, that is personally the way that I, I suspect it may have been intended. And so I think that it, uh, it is important that we realize that these words being used to try to make, a, make an argument about the nature and the character of the biblical text are made very loosely and by creating certain assumptions or bypassing certain assumptions so that we don't realize that's an assumption you're making here. And so I would reject this as being one of those texts that can be used to say anything about the, the quality of the biblical text. Another verse that I see often used would be 1 Peter 1.23, where, uh, where it says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Now, there's a lot in this verse that I could say, and that I could even um, disagree with the way that it tends to be applied. But here again, uh, the word uh, lagu is used here is, is a word which is, is more often than not used to make a reference to an argument, a, a reasoning uh, that it gets expressed. 
an idea that is expressed, a sense of purpose that is, an agenda that is expressed. And that may or may not be a reference to anything included in the biblical text, or maybe something merely a part of their, their experience of, think about it. If they believe in Yahweh, if they believe in God, if they believe in this presence of a God, there's a sense in which the presence of this God is something other than the presence of the words that we have written about that God. And so, therefore, the reasoning of God, uh, and notice this is the lagu, it's not, it's not the word for writings, it's the word for reasonings. Uh, so it's, it has more to do with the logic of God, the, the purpose of God as understood, possibly even as expressed in the writings, but, but as more understood through the natural sense of what is in their daily experience of God and his presence and what he seems to be at, involved in in the way they understood him and perceived him within the culture, within the people. And so uh, that this birth that is being spoken of here, and we could, we could talk about this later as to what that might actually mean, it is not a reference to the biblical text, but rather a reference to that uh, that which has, um, you know, and I would even say the biblical text is perishable. But the purposes and the reasoning and the logic of God are not. And so that would seem to me that uh, that just by the fact that perishable and imperishable are being uh, compared compared here, that we're not necessarily talking about something that can kind of decay. And fall. In fact, uh, how many copies of the biblical text have been made that are no longer in existence because uh, they perished? You know, they're gone. Uh, so, uh, and I, I understand that it's possible to say, well, yeah, but we got copies of copies of copies. So it's kind of survived. And yes, it has. But at the same time, this word here does not reference writings. It references reasonings. And so, therefore, it is a reference to maybe something contained in the writings or implied or communicated by the writings, but it is not a reference to the writings themselves. And so I would argue that 1 Peter 1.23 is not a verse that can be used to say anything about the quality or the nature of the biblical text, but rather something about the, the promises of, of God. Now, the, the main verse that is often used to try to make the claim that the Bible is the, um, in, uh, is the inspired and inerrant and infallible word of God is uh, 2 Timothy 3. This is uh, perhaps the kingpin verse. This is one of the biggest verses that is often used. And um, I, I saved it for you know, I wanted to wait till I got to it because I wanted to show you something. In fact, before I get to that, let me let me show you. Um, I had a discussion with some. I was looking for a copy of my discussion. I still couldn't find that copy, although there was another document I was looking for last last time I was speaking to you, and I did find that one. I was glad I did. But um, it, it we can find, and and I could take I could take several shows, uh, but I would end up just repeating myself. Uh, of looking at various different statements by Jesus, various different statements by Paul, various different statements by Peter, by Titus, by Luke, all these different people uh, who are making statements that can be interpreted as being a statement about the biblical text. And yet it isn't. It's just that tradition has found it advantageous to their agenda and their theology to translate it as such and to interpret it as such because this is in agreement with their theology. But it is not, as far as I can see, an honest attempt to allow the text to speak for itself what it is saying, but rather a way of distorting and perverting the text into what I want it to say. And that's why I started with the particular verse tonight that I did, because it discussed the fact that there are ignorant and abusive people who are uh, doing this to distort the text as they do a lot of other texts. And you know what? <laughs> that, that reminds me of one other thing before I get to 2 Timothy 3, 14, 16. I was up at a, a bookstore uh, the other day at a Bible college, and I found a book up there that I, I didn't buy it. I, I, I should have bought it. You know what? I think I did buy it, but it's packed away. I think I did buy it. It was a book that was a survey of the beliefs and teachings of various different philosophers uh, that uh, they wanted to demonstrate how dangerous these philosophies were as opposed to God. 
Uh, and you know, if it was, it was everyone in there from you know from Foucault, Levinas to Wittgenstein to uh, uh, various people who just don't take a, an evangelical or fundamentalist view. And and there was uh, there were all of these different philosophers, and you know, from Karl Marx. I just I just I can't remember all of them right now. But I mean, the, the book contained I, I, probably close to a hundred, a hundred. 50 maybe different philosophers and it explained their philosophy and how it was really contrary to you know quote the word of god and and i started reading this book and to be honest with you i i certainly wouldn't agree with all those philosophers either but uh, one thing that was clear to me in reading this book is the person who wrote this book doesn't have a clue what these philosophers really teach or what they imply, or what they would believe to be an appropriate application of what it was they asserted uh, to be a way of making sense of things. And uh, it, it amazed me that, uh, th but, you know, this is typical of that uh, that uh, Second Peter 3 uh, uh, problem here, that, you know, these people, they don't just distort the biblical text. They distort every text they read. They distort everything and try to put it into something that's with us or against us in terms of their theology. And they do this with everything they read. And they, they really can't read, in a sense, is what I'm saying. And it, it, the book was, was just, to me, uh, an astounding work of tremendous ignorance where it was obvious they had no clue how to understand the philosophers they were even opposed to. Uh, so, I mean, even if they could have opposed some of them for good reasons, they didn't seem to have the good reasons for opposing them. It was just a strange book to me. And I remember the first time I saw it, I didn't buy it because uh, this is garbage. But I later did go back, and I remember now that I bought it. Uh, but since the flood, it's been packed away, and I haven't gotten it out. But uh, what a book. You know, it was strange, but it's another example of how people who are in the habit of distorting any text for their purposes will distort every and any text they get a hold of uh, for their purposes, including the the writings of uh, various philosophers who aren't present right now to defend themselves from uh, the abuses and distortions of this book that tried to present to Christians uh, what's so terribly uh, faithful and godless about uh, faithless and godless about uh, these writings. Anyway, so here we go on to Second uh, Timothy three uh, fourteen through sixteen. Now, this is a text which, when it is translated, typically um, talks about how um, uh, Timothy had confidently already learned as a young uh, child. Um, various things, and he had to uh, remember its source. Uh, namely, he remembers from childhood the the sacred scriptures, which uh, are the holy scriptures that uh, that that uh, that had him to find salvation in Jesus Christ, and that he's now encouraged, uh, according to this, the way it's translated, to. Um, to recognize that all scripture is God breathed or inspired of God and is useful for uh, you know, various things that it, that it then says it's useful for, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Uh, and and this, this verse, these verses here in the letter to Timothy are translated as if it's trying to tell Timothy, look at, you know, the Bible is just so radically important. The scripture is extremely important. It's inspired by God. And this is what people need in order to be perfect, in order to be everything they need to be. They need this word. And it's translated to make it sound that way. But guess what? That's a dishonest translation. That's not what it says in Greek. It doesn't say that. In fact, this is a, a clear example in my opinion, almost inarguable, of how the general and the particular are contrasted uh, with each other. In fact, uh, when it says, on the one hand, uh, you know, uh, abiding what you confidently learned, remembering its source, and, uh, and Timothy uh, is told, namely, you remember from childhood the sacred literature. Now, the, uh, perhaps the word sacred is even uh, the incorrect word here. It's more the word temple, temple literature. So uh, th he's talking to Timothy about the writings associated with, you know, with, with Moses and the prophets. So I, I recognize that he's, this is a reference to the biblical text, specifically the biblical text, sacred literature uh, or temple literature uh, that now enables you to wisely trust that you are safe in believing in Jesus Christ. 
But then it comes contrasted with uh, all literature, all writings. So Paul is now moving on from not just the writings associated with our religious faith, but he's saying, you know, uh, uh, all writings are theopneustos. He's talking about the quality, of the very fact that there are documents out there that people thought significant enough to make mass copies of them. They're all very, very useful for various different purposes. And uh, all literature is, uh, is God-breathed. And by the way, theopneustos being the word there, nobody in the entire universe knows exactly what that word means. The only place it ever occurs is, um, is in reference to Paul's use of it here. Uh, there, there was at one time somebody told me that there was a, uh, an Alexandrian document that used the word theopneustos in talking about it as an accounting term. But I, I've, I've not been able to successfully dig that out. It, it's, it's possible, but I, uh, it doesn't make sense to me. But in the, I have, I've looked for it, and I, I couldn't find it. Uh, I continue to look for it. still can't find it. But uh, nonetheless, nobody knows what the, it's, it's an unusual coined term. Uh, and the fact that people are made in the image of God and that God has things to say, there are temple writings, when people have things to say, they say that as the image of God in many ways. So uh, Paul is trying to elevate all literature here, and that's clearly what he's saying, all writings. He's not saying all just biblical texts. He already has talked about the biblical text in the prior verse, and now he's making a comparison and a contrast between the specific and the general. Not just the temple writings, but all writings. And in saying this, he's talking about all writings, and he says they're useful for various things. Now, it's translated in a way to make it sound like it all has something to do with religious discipline, but it doesn't. These words are squeezed into spiritual discipleship terms only because the translators want to do that. They can't justify doing that uh, by a true knowledge of Greek. All literature is God-breathed and useful for teaching, persuading, setting things straight, for educating the right way to do things, which will make the, the man of God well-rounded and prepared for doing anything, anything worthwhile. So Timothy is being encouraged to expand his boundaries beyond just the biblical text and to consider everything that's being written as possessing a real potential for usefulness so that uh, of all the things that could be done by him as a man of God, he might be able to do anything, anything worth doing well. Uh, you know, anything worth doing is worth doing well. And the best way to do something well is to educate yourself about it. And one of the best ways to educate yourself about anything is to read up on it. What if you want to become a better accountant? I would read up on it if I were you. Maybe even get a degree. Suppose you want to deal with counseling. I'd read up on it, you know. And uh, what if you want to become a better musician? I'd read up on music theory. I'd read up on a variety of things. There's a lot of literature out there in the world that will, if you read it, provide you with a great deal of useful information so that the worthwhile things you find doing can be done with excellence and be done very well. This is what these verses are talking about. Paul is encouraging Timothy to move beyond the mere isolated sense of just studying the biblical text and to say, look, you know, get yourself an education, be well-educated, be well-rounded, develop all your skills, everything in life that you have to do. Even if you're going to cook yourself dinner, become a better cook, find out how to cook. You know, if you're going to have to make your tent, read up on it, make better tents. You know, uh, if you're going to be, uh, making yourself a little boat, figure out how to make a better boat or something. Whatever it is you're going to find worth doing, do it well and discover how well it can be done by discovering the things that people who know what they're talking about have written about. And that's what this uh, this section of the text is talking about. So I've, I've gone through a variety of these things, and I could continue to talk about a variety of things, but what I've discovered is this. You know, I find the biblical text useful. I do. 
I find it an interesting testimony. I find it a valuable testimony to help me to understand and discern some of the things that may have actually been going on here. Uh, but uh, I do not see the biblical text as making these claims about itself as it has been translated or interpreted. Now, it looks like we have a, uh, a viewer comment here. Thanks, Bob. I love hearing a rational view toward this subject. Hearing someone say something that lots of people are thinking, but few are actually saying out loud. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and I tell you, I wish more people would 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 think about this, and I wish that more evangelicals and fundamentalists would get honest about it. And I'll tell you, uh, I think it's important for me to end with, uh, with, with a particular point here, and that is this. Having uh, I, I studied Greek in a, in a, in a, in a biblical context, uh, you know, under a biblical influence, reading books that were given to me by, um, by, by fundamentalists or evangelicals. And it wasn't until I began studying linguistic anthropology that I realized that so many of the principles that I had been taught were a violation of language in, a, in the way that language really works. And it forced me, after I got an education in linguistic anthropology, to go back and reconsider the Greek. And if there's one thing that I have learned is this, and I, uh, and, and you know, I got to tell you this, those people out there who are evangelicals and fundamentalists who claim they can deal with the Greek, they don't know Greek. They don't. All they know is what they've been taught, that they're parroting, that have been part of that, which has been given to them by their, by their alleged traditions but they have not studied Greek in a linguistic manner, in a manner that does honesty with language according to the way we have understood how language works. By the way, maybe in the next show, I might talk to you a little bit about how do linguists determine how to properly uh, unpack a document from a dead language. Uh, actually, it looks to me like I have a few minutes, so let me just in brief talk a little bit about that. Linguists can do things like this. They can take a person who doesn't know anything about linguistics. They can try to teach them a, a particular language they don't know and ask this person to try to make certain translations from a language uh, that they don't know once they are learning it. And then they can compare the quality and the clarity of what this person does with that with how a person who is bilingual in that language, uh, very familiar with both languages, the language translated from and the language translated into, and to see what these differences are. And by doing this over and over and over and over again, linguists can determine the kinds of mistakes that people not familiar with a language can make when attempting to understand it. That is, how does a person learn a language there where they have no native speakers of that language to compare it with? And we can do that by isolating people, by not allowing them to talk with a native speaker while they attempt to learn a language and see the kinds of mistakes they make. We can then take a look at the way that people try to understand a dead language and recognize how some of those same principal mistakes are being made in that process. And in so doing it, we can develop better methodologies for discovering how a person who has no access to a native speaker can nonetheless get better and deeper into the nitty gritty of a language uh, that uh, to them is as good as dead. Uh, as that's one of the things they can do. And that, that is a very helpful technique uh, that, that many linguists are involved in, in helping to develop. But these are concepts and principles that most people who are involved in translating the Bible, uh, they, they don't even care about these problems. They don't even know about these problems. And to me, this brings me back to the original part that I wanted to talk to you about uh, when I was quoting um, – when I was quoting Peter here, where he said, I want you to bear in mind that uh, these are ignorant and unstable people. And I, I think that when I see the kind of twisting that they do with the biblical text, the ignorance that they have over a linguistic uh, elements and dynamics, their complete ignorance over the, the, the problems of dealing with the lingua franca, the complete prob the deep problems that they have in dealing with the dead language, the fact that they're not even educated in these things, they don't even have any clue what kind of mistakes they can be making. I'm telling you, these people don't know Greek, and I don't believe you can trust their translations.
Uh, I, I, they're, they're helpful and useful in some ways, but I think in the end, you need to realize um, they don't possess the kind of scholarship they pretend to. Now, I got to be honest with you. If you don't possess that scholarship, you really can't judge whether I'm trying to deceive you. The truth is, you have to either try to figure out whether or not these people seem to have a style that's deceptive, or whether I seem to have a style that's deceptive, or you're going to have to actually get yourself an education in Greek and linguistics and determine for yourself whether or not what I'm saying is even true. And you can't do that without that knowledge and that education. So, you know, that's unfortunately leaves you in that conundrum, but there's no other way to be, unfortunately, unless you're going to resolve it in one of those ways. So anyhow, that's about all the time we have today. I thank you for giving me the time. And, uh, and hopefully you've gained some insight into what I would perceive as the twisting and the abuse and the distorting of the biblical text to try and cause people to believe that it's saying something about itself that it really isn't saying. Thanks so much. I'm Bob Graves, the Unconventional Pastor, and we'll catch you again some other day. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned in just a moment right here on the Florida Studio stage.